Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar tonight on pelvic organ prolapse. Presenting this evening is Mr. Abhishek Gupta, our consultant urogynecologist, and myself, Jan Chasley, the clinical nurse specialist for continence care. This presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the question and answer icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without leaving your name. Please note that this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you'd like to book a consultation, we'll provide details at the end of this session. I'll now hand over to Mr. Gupta and you'll hear from me again shortly. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. So my name is uh, Abhishek Gupta. I'm a consultant gynecologist and um, I'm urogynecologist, which is uh, doctors who have a special interest in, tre uh, in um, treating prolapse and incontinence. Um, so I, I got uh, into Southeast London rotation and did my training in the Southeast London rotation. I'm a consultant gynecologist and urogynecologist at Dartford and Grisham NHS Trust. And I also do, um, I of course, also a special interest in keyhole or laparoscopy surgery. After I completed the advanced training in vaginal surgery, as well as laparoscopy and urogynecology, and I'm a member of British Society of Urogynecologists and also in their governance committee. So that's my brief background. So what's included in this session? So it's very important. Um, I think the when we put our put this webinar on, um, we we wanted to take um, into consideration what actually pelvic organ prolapse means for the patients. It's more more of an awareness, more of a understanding what it means for you. It's more of what symptoms does it cause and how to recognize where you need treatment and what you can do to help yourself. And also, if you do have to go down the route of any surgical intervention, what it means and what are the aims and objective for that. So this is a kind of a brief overview which we included in this session. And I hope um, that it, is, it will be informative for you, as well as you'll have a greater understanding of what prolapse means, what symptom it, it does produce, and what treatment options you have and when to seek for um, treatment as well. And we will also give a bit more background of uh, if you do have an operation, what to expect postoperatively and how the recovery process does work and what to expect and not to expect. So what is pelvic organ prolapse? So if you look into a human anatomy, this is two dimensional picture. So if we can say that we are looking at the woman from the side, um, first thing you notice is a, this is a pubic bone here, which my cursor is showing. Just behind the pubic bone, you will find this little balloon-like thing, which is called bladder, and which drains water out, which is called urethra here. Now, just behind that, there is, this is womb. That's the neck of the womb. This is vagina, and that is back passage. So what is prolapse? So prolapse is basically a hernia of any of this organ. So can you see there's support structure here between bladder and the vagina? There's support structure here between vagina and the back passage. And the womb has got support structure here, which is not seen in this diagram, but they're called ligaments. So when they get weakened for one reason or the other, they start to come down, which is a herniation through. So if the womb come down, it's called womb prolapse or uterine prolapse. If the bladder starts to descend here, that's called cystocele or that's called bladder prolapse. And if the bowel starts to come here, that's called rectocele or um, bowel prolapse. Now, in this particular picture, you can see the, the, the womb is primarily prolapsing down. This is a prolapse womb. Now, what causes this weakness? which leads to a prolapse. So the basic trigger, and this is the, your collagen, which collagen, which is your support structure, which gets weakened and hence you get the prolapse. What causes the weakness? Um, childbirth, which is a vaginal birth, which is especially if you have an instrumental delivery with the forceps or ventus or a prolonged childbirth, then that causes uh, trauma to pelvic floor or the weakness to this area. Repeated straining, for example, 
if you're chronically constipated and you have to strain to um, empty the bowel, then constant straining will have an impact on the pelvic flow. If you suffer from, a, uh, from chronic um, really bad chest and you have to cough all the time, it's not good for pelvic flow. Um, lifting heavy weight. So if, if you're in a profession or somewhere where you have to constantly lift heavy weight, the access to the heavy weight um, pressure goes through the pelvis and then it, uh, repeated strain will make this weaker and more make you more susceptible for prolapse. Uh, similarly, if you had a previous uh, surgery in this area, or even if you have hysterectomy, sometimes for a non-prolapse reason, for example, if you have a hysterectomy for fibroids or heavy periods or cancer or some other reason, then all the structure which holds prolapse uh, womb is cut and hence it makes you more susceptible for prolapse of the top of the vagina or the bladder or the back of the vagina. Um, and, the, and, and the last but not the least, unfortunately, all of us are going to get older. We're not going to get young, younger. And hence with age, the support structure do get weak. And, and the other big thing which happens to a female's body is going through the menopause. Uh, and menopause is a quite a big trauma to a female body. And it does... Uh, increases your chances of prolapse and it becomes more um, it becomes more um, uh, when you get, get into menopausal age group then things become, uh, the tissues become more weaker so what are the symptoms so symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse are that you may feel heaviness around your lower tummy and in the vaginal area you can get a dragging sensation because when when the prolapse do pull and it's coming down, it can give you a lot of dragging sensation. Some people do have a backache. Uh, patients describe it in various uh, different um, symptoms. They can feel like something is coming down in the vagina. It may feel like sitting on a small ball. Um, you can feel lump in the vagina. It can feel uncomfortable during sexual intercourse. And sometimes if, the blood, if it's quite full, and if you notice in my previous slide, if the bladder is coming down here, it can kink this tube which drains water out, which is called urethra. And if it does kink it, then you might feel, sorry, you might feel that you're not able to empty the bladder well. And hence, sometimes you go for waterworks, then you come back and then you feel that you are not emptied the the water, uh, you're not emptied your bladder well, and have to go back and empty it more. And similarly, it can happen with when your bowels are full. It may found a little pouch which is going into the vagina, and some people may have to push it from the vagina to empty your bowel. Sometimes stress incontinence can happen. That's more of a um, uh, uh, more of weakness at the level of the bladder neck. But these are the common symptoms of prolapse. Patients do have sometimes feel a lot of pain. And then they go to a, their practice nurse or general practitioner and they say, this, you've got a prolapse and hence you've got pain. The prolapse usually causes discomfort until unless you've got, a, it's, you've got a very big prolapse. It usually doesn't cause a lot of pain. It can cause discomfort, but not a pain. Pain may be a sign that you have a lack of estrogen or hormone in the vagina, which sometimes make the skin very, very thin, and that can cause pain. But prolapse per se doesn't cause pain that much. It may cause dragging and discomfort. So what are the treatment um, um, of pelvic organ prolapse. So if you have a problem with your bladder, your GP or prolapse, your GP may refer you to us. We sometimes check uh, urine to make sure that you don't have infection and that's causing you the problems. Occasionally, we may have to look inside the bladder depending on what uh, symptoms you have. Uh, if you have a mild symptoms or mild prolapse and you, um, it's not affecting your quality of life 
that much. Just a simple lifestyle changes, um, like avoiding constipation. If you are on overweight side, then you need to lose weight. That will help both with the symptoms of prolapse. And obviously, uh, and if you ever have to have a surgery in future, it will help to you recover quicker and reduce your chance of failure of the surgery. Avoid, sometimes avoiding lifting heavy weight or preventing constipation. These are kind of uh, things which you can do it yourself. If you have a mild symptoms or mild prolapse or uh, um, early stages of prolapse, and that can help uh, it not getting worse in future. Uh, the main objective of any treatment of pelvic organ prolapse is to manage your quality of life. So there can be functional aspect, which is um, it is affecting doing things like you're not able to empty the bladder well, you are not able, able to have intercourse very well, or you're not emptying the bowel well, or it's giving a lot of dragging sensations. So it is a symptoms we're correcting or function, function we are correcting. And that's the main objective of any treatment of pelvic organ prolapse is the function which we need to correct. If your quality of life is um, not disturbed, I get referrals from some of the primary care when a patient has gone to have a normal smear done and the smear, and they're not aware of any prolapse and the nurse has picked up a prolapse and sent the patient to us. If you are not symptomatic with that, it doesn't need treatment. You can try pelvic exercises or uh, or manage it yourself. It doesn't need any surgical or any other treatment. Prolapse, which causes you a symptom and you're the best person to know what it's affecting your quality of life, then it needs treatment. So what are the treatment prolapse? The first step is to do pelvic floor exercises. Then we'll come to hormonal treatment and then pest, vaginal pest freeze and surgery. So I'll hand over the mic to Jan, who's our specialist nurse here, uh, who who takes patients for continence care and pelvic floor exercises. Over to you, Jan. Now. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Um, yeah, so I'm the clinical nurse specialist here at Benedon. I've been in this role now for 12 years. Um, and prior to that, I probably had 10 years experience it just in general gynecology. Um, I manage the specialist nurse team here as well. We have four specialist nurses and we run nurse led clinics. So you can just come and have a referral just to continence care. You don't always need to have to see a consultant. So what happens when you come to our appointment? Um, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask lots of questions. Um, we want to assess how your prolapse is affecting you. Um, and as Mr. Gupta said, a lot of it is around how is it impacting on your quality of life? Um, is it affecting your bladder? So if it is, we're going to test your urine to rule out a urine infection. Um, we can then scan your bladder to check how much urine is left behind. Um, when you empty your bladder, you never empty your bladder completely. There's always going to be maybe up to 100 mils left behind. But if there's an excess of that, that may go with some of your symptoms of urine infections, of getting urgency, of feeling that you need to empty your bladder frequently. Um, and we'll help you manage that with things like bladder retraining. Um, we'll look at your fluid intake. Um, are you having too much caffeine? Are you drinking enough? Or are you sort of restricting your intake to manage some symptoms? And if bowels are a bit of an issue, we'll give you some dietary advice there as well. Um, the bladder retraining is all about not always sort of emptying your bladder every time you see a toilet. Um, it's doing things like um, double voiding. If you feel you're not emptying the bladder, then emptying the bladder, go back after 10 minutes and empty again, particularly at night. Uh, structured pelvic floor muscle exercises, um, they're key. And the guidelines say structured pelvic floor for at least four months, um, you know, potentially before you look at any other interventions. If you're having issues with constipation or if you're having issues, um, as Mr. Gupta said, actually physically emptying the bowel out because the prolapse is bulging in um, and making that difficult, we'll give you advice to manage that. Um, weight loss is obviously going to help if you're if you're overweight. Um, and we'll give you advice about exercise, um, particularly if you're on a weight loss program and you're trying to exercise. If you've got prolapse, you probably don't want to be doing too much in the way of squatting, lunges, kettleballing, certain weights. Um, so we'll help man you know, manage your symptoms um, and help you exercise safely. Um, so if you're doing pelvic floor exercises, 
Um, and remember, a pelvic floor contraction is a very subtle movement. It's not about pulling your tummy in tight, squeezing your buttocks, holding your breath, because then all of your energy is going into other places. It's purely just focusing on that area between your legs. And particularly if your prolapse is around, you can feel a vaginal lump or you can see a vaginal lump, imagine with your pelvic floor that you're literally trying to suck that prolapse back into the vagina with just a very gentle movement. So when you're doing exercises, you do fast contractions and strong contractions to work the muscle effectively. With a fast contraction, you'll just squeeze that muscle up while you count to one and relax it for a count of one and generally sort of look at doing 10 of those at, at a time. And because they're sort of relatively quick and easy, you can do those little and often throughout the day. Um, if you've got prolapse, you definitely want to work on the strong contractions and build that strength and support up. So start by sort of maybe just squeezing it while you count to four, repeating it a few times, gradually trying to build that up. Um, as you feel that strength is increasing and aim to do that potentially three times during the day. If you're doing the strong contractions, give yourself a little bit of time to really concentrate on them so you can get a good strong contraction. And you can do these exercises, whether you're sitting down, lying in bed, sitting in the chair, you know, so you can fit them in when the dinner's cooking. If you're sat in the car at traffic lights, you've not got to get a mat out and give sort of structured time for it. It's little and often through the day. Um, and as I say, it's at least three to four months to start to strengthen up that muscle. Um, so the general advice around that is don't give up, stick with them. Thank you, Jen. Uh, so we'll go for the treatment option. I'll quickly talk about um, some of um, the hormone pestries, which we are hormone, which we recommend through the vagina. Which is um, which is quite local. Which is uh, either comes in a tube to which a couple of applicator which you can put in the vagina before you go to bed, or it can come with a little um, um, tablet form or um, a, a, which which again comes with an applicator which you can put in the vagina, or sometimes it comes with a ring, which is uh, which uh, excretes a controlled amount of estrogen uh, every day. So either a cream or a little suppository, or it comes with a uh, like a ring. So that's a vaginal estrogen. Now, in this this estrogen treatment locally is um, when you, especially with patients who are menopausal age group, when they have symptom of prolapse or they have discomfort, dragging, and uh, pain during intercourse. There's a condition called vulvo vaginal atrophy where the skin down below becomes very, very thin. And when it happens, it can cause a lot of discomfort. And this um, hormone will make, to do, make the skin more supple. It will help for you to feel much more comfortable. And even if you go down the route of any uh, pessary for treatment of, uh, uh, of prolapse or any operation, this helps to heal up better. Now, apart from... Uh, so if you look into the fine print of any, um, if you've ever been prescribed this medication, if you look into the fine print of uh, what the product says, it will tell you all, this, all the contraindication for a hormone replacement therapy. However, it is a very small dose and it's local. So amount which comes in your bloodstream is so little that the side effects are generally not there with this um, treatment. It's, it's very, very safe. And with the little uh, with the little um, tablet form, which is which we uh, asked, which which is called Vagifem, which we used to uh, put in the vagina, they can be used for long term on twice weekly basis, which will really help patients. And uh, and apart from a contraindication, if you have breast cancer, not your family, not anyone else, if you have breast cancer, then we'll try to avoid it until unless. It's uh, been cleared by your uh, breast surgeon. Otherwise, there's no much contraindication of having local hormones because, as I said, it's uh, local, it's very effective, it's very small dose, and the amount which comes in your bloodstream is very little. So it's very well tolerated and fairly safe. And that helps 
with the and when you have mild prolapse and valvular general atrophy, this really works very well. Then the next steps or next options you have is specifics. So there, uh, as you can see in this um, little slide here, they come in various um, various uh, different shapes. They are, also comes in various different sizes. And this first pessary is called a ring pessary. This is a donut pessary. This is a ring pessary with support, and this is called gel horn. So there are various pessaries, and depends on whether you have the uterus or you had a previous hysterectomy, and which and how big the prolapse is. This um, very different pessaries are suitable for uh, different con different uh, kind of prolapse, and also um, different patient age, uh, different patient uh, subgroup. So we have to individualize patients about according to which pessaries to use. Now, pessaries come in various sizes, as I said, depending on the size of the prolapse, I mind of the vaginal capacity, we, we size the prolapse and uh, put the pessary if you opt for. Um, they are successful roughly in 50% of the patients, so discontinuation rate is roughly one in two. Uh, and uh, the patients who are sexually active, until unless they can change the pessaries themselves, they don't usually prefer. If patients do want to have pessary because they want to avoid surgery or they're not suitable for surgery, then this needs to be to be looked at every four to six months so that we need to know that this pessary is still the same right size for you. We have to make sure that it's not causing any ulcers from the pressure. We also have to make sure that we either wash and reinsert if it's made of silicone or if it's made of latex, we have to change to a new one. And to, um, so this needs to be done every four to six months. What are the common side effects? Sometimes it doesn't work in the sense that the pessaries are, um, if it's not stitched anywhere, your muscles have to still hold it in place. If you've got a really weak pelvic floor, it didn't come out. Uh, and it's not about which size we put in. If it's uh, a pelvic floor is weak, it can come out. Uh, it sometimes gives you very um, uh, unpleasant smell and a discharge because of irritation of the skin. Uh, hormones do help to reduce the discharge as well as uh, reduce any risk of infections and also makes the changes easier for the patient and more comfortable. Um, it can occasionally cause infection and soreness and irritation. Sometimes it does cause uh, pressure in your bladder and sometimes patients do complain that they may have to go for water works a bit more often. And uh, also um, it can cause um, some bleeding. However, if uh, you have the pessary in and you are in a menopausal age group and you um, still have the uterus, if you have any bleeding, you should contact a healthcare professional to ensure that uh, this bleeding is not coming from any other source, but only from the pessary itself. Now coming to surgical options. So if, you, if your prolapse is really symptomatic to you and you want to have the surgical option. So if you have the bladder, which is coming down in the vagina, then this is the area from the vagina. We open this area up, push the bladder back in and we bring your native tissues and close it. You know, uh, we bring together your native tissue with the use of stitches and, and um, suture this up. Similarly. We do the same thing if your if your uh, back passage is prolapsing in your uh, vagina, which is called rectocil. The front is called cystocil, the back is called rectocil. If that's happening, then we do the same thing. We open the vagina from the back, we open the vagina here, and then we bring the muscles together and close it up. So that's uh, front wall repair. That's the back wall repair. I mean, this picture is uh, the patient who previously had a hysterectomy. And this is just like what the top of the vagina. If the top of the vagina has started to come down, then that can be stitched with a very strong ligament called a sacrospinous ligament. Um, and that's the stitching approach. And this can all be done through the vagina. Now, for vaginal mesh, so the mesh is, which is done through the vagina for prolapse surgery has now completely been stopped in a UK since 2018. So we don't do any vaginal mesh operations anymore since 2018. Um, 
And but if the top of the vagina is coming down on a high vigilance restriction, i.e., very selected patient where everything has a fail or the size of the vagina is uh, restricted, you may be offered a mesh operation through the tummy to put the mesh through and stitch it to a bone here. The mesh operations are only done in a very selected uh, centers. Benetton, we certainly don't do any mesh operations, and it's only done on a very small cohort of patients who are not suitable for any other form of surgeries. But we try to do the surgery if it's using your native tissues uh, or your own tissues and, and um, do through the vagina. So now, if the womb is coming down, then what are our other options? So we have touched base on that if the bladder is coming down, we open from here, and then um, do the bring your tissues together here, which are weakened, um, and similarly for the bowel here. But if the womb is coming down, what are our options? So the commonest operation we do for the womb prolapse is a hysterectomy, which is taking the womb and the neck of the womb out through the vagina. And then there is, there is a ligament called uh, uterosacral ligament, which is here somewhere, which we stitch on the top of the vagina. Uh, and that... Um, that works well, and this is one of the commonest operations I do for the womb prolapse, and gives me good good results. Uh, if uh, the womb can also be stitched with a strong ligament called sacrospinous ligament, which is called sacrospinous cervicopexy, this is a conservative option of uh, womb prolapse. So one is a hysterectomy. If you don't want to do a hysterectomy, the alternative are to do a sacrospinous cervicopexy, which is with a stitch. We stitch the neck of the womb with a strong ligament called sacrospinous ligament. It's as invasive as hysterectomy, and the recovery period is almost the same. Uh, it's a good procedure. It gives a good success rate to resuspend the womb. However, if you have a big bladder prolapse alongside with your womb prolapse, then, so, uh, then technically, it once I give more support to the womb, it prevents uh, me giving good support here at the bladder level. So I found with my surgical experience, if you are have an associated bladder prolapse, which is quite big, then doing a hysterectomy repair works better than resuspending the womb and doing the repair. If you don't have a big bladder prolapse and only, uh, only mainly the womb prolapse, then hysterectomy or um, doing the suspension operation are equally um, good in terms of the outcomes. Sacrohistopexy. So this, this uh, surgery is to show the laparoscopic, which is the keyhole which has gone in. Sacrohistopexy is an operation which is used of a mesh. So we go through the tummy, put a mesh around the neck of the womb and suspend it here to the bone. So it lifts uh, the womb as, a, as almost like a tent. Now this surgery, again, as I said, is done only in the specialist center mesh operation. It does have a role to play in patients who have a prolapse and not completed their family and they're quite symptomatic. So then the meshes do work uh, in those cohort of patients, but they're selected and only done in few surgeries. Then something called obliterative surgery. So we get patients who have huge prolapses and also sometimes we do the operation and this the prolapse comes back and it's difficult to re-put the prolapse back in place. So patients who are not sexually active, that's the most important thing. Patients who are not sexually active or they're very infert, unfit for surgery, sometimes we do obliterative surgery, which doesn't happen too often, but occasionally when we uh, basically, in a, in, in a simple language, close the vagina so that the womb or the top of the vagina doesn't have space to come down. But this is only an only reserve for patients who are not sexually active or patients who have failed previous surgeries multiple occasions. But if you're sexually active, this operation is not for you. So uh, what are the possible complications with surgery? Obviously, there is a risk of anesthesia, um, especially when um, any major uh, like hysterectomy or sacrospinous fixation, there is a risk of bleeding and require blood transfusion. How often this happens is uh, around one to two and hundred patients uh, will need blood transfusion. So around 2%. As you can appreciate, we operate very close to bladder and the bowel and a tube draining from kidney to bladder called ureter, that the surrounding organ damage can happen. Now, how often this happens? Again, the risk of uh, happening of any injury to surrounding organs is less than a percent, so less than one in 100. Uh, 
infection is common because uh, the operative site is very close to the back passage, which has got full of germs. So sometimes uh, infections are common. And hence, after the operation, we ask you to just keep it clean. Um, anything cut heals with scarring. So if you're going through a surgical route, you have to keep in mind that if whatever operation you have, this can cause scarring and that can cause pain in the intercourse. It usually settles on with time and as the, as the scar stretches. However, sometimes you have to take you back to theater and, uh, and um, divide the scar tissue. Some bleeding and discharge is common. Um, and we always cover this with cover this operation with an injection to thin your blood to prevent what is called DVT or clot in the leg. And on the day of the operation, you also get compression stockings, which helps to reduce your risk of clot in the legs. Now, two more things to consider or uh, take into account um, after any prolapse operation. One is prolapse can come back because at the end of the day, we are trying to bring the tissues together and make it stronger. And, and um, but unfortunately, the inf as the time goes, the tissues can get weak again, and hence the prolapse can come back. And how often it happens? If you look into the, the um, various literature, one in three out of 10 women will have to go undergo a repeat surgery in future. And it's more common with the bladder, less common from the back of the vagina where the bowel prolapses. That's, made, that's because there's more muscles on the back which we can bring together than the front. And it's more common for the bladder prolapse to come back. So prolapse can come back. What can you do to reduce your chance of, uh, of reoccurrence of prolapse is, again, avoiding lifting weight, avoiding constipation, i.e. you're not, <clears throat> sorry, you're not uh, straining too much, uh, not gain, um, uh, keeping your weight, uh, optimizing your weight and keeping them uh, weight as normal as possible. And if you are a smoker, please avoid or reduce or, or preferably stop smoking because no, smokers don't heal very well. <clears throat> and with smoking or a bad chest, uh, you will have more chance of prolapse coming back in future. So those are the few things which you can do to reduce your chances of prolapse coming back after the surgery. So recovering from surgery. So most of this is surgical surgeries. You can go home the next day. So um, the, it's not that it, after the surgery, if it goes straight forward, then you can go home next day. It's not that you have to be in hospital for a long time. And if it's just a repair on the back of the vagina with no bladder uh, bladder prolapse needed or a hysterectomy or repair of the top of the vagina needed, just a prolapse of rectocil, then you may be able to go home the same day as well. Uh, you usually give, um, put a catheter, draining your bladder, uh, which usually stays for 24 hours and comes out. Majority of patients will be able to pass urine very well and go home on the uh, next day after the catheter is taken out. Very occasionally, once we fix the prolapse, it takes a bit of time for bladder to recover and the and the swelling around the operation site can prevent you passing urine well. In that occasion, you may go home with the catheter for a period of uh, seven to 10 days, but majority patient will pass urine next day and we take the catheter out. We put a pack in the vagina uh, after the operation, especially if you have a hysterectomy or any major uh, pelvic floor operation, that is just to put a pressure in that area to reduce the chances of bleeding. And it can be slightly uncomfortable, but comes out first thing in the morning after the operation day. Uh, you may find a bit of bleeding with the stitches dissolved. It gives a bit of discharge and bleeding, but you shouldn't get anything heavier. We want the patients to start moving pretty much next day. We don't want patients to be on hospital in the couch or not mobilizing. We want them to mobilize and then, uh, and then slightly build it up. Uh, and that also reduces chances of um, clot in the leg. You can have the shower pretty much from the next day. Uh, if you look into literature, they said you can have the bath, but I personally, this is my personal practice to ask patients not to take bath, uh, but take shower for 
at least four to six weeks when the stitches are still um, holding together and um, are not dissolving. Avoid swimming for obvious reason for six weeks and for at least six to eight weeks, avoid sexual intercourse because the stitches are still in uh, in situ and you don't want them to be um, uh, them to be disturbed. And depending on what kind of job you do, if your job is not very strenuous, then most of the patients should most of the patients should return back to their normal activity in four to six weeks and should be able to resume your job. Some people do have prolonged um, standing in their jobs or their jobs can be quite um, physically taxing. Then sometimes we give them a phased return after six weeks. But usually patients should be going back to normality within six to eight weeks of um, uh, of their procedure. And that's a brief overview on prolapse and what options you have and understanding of where to seek help from prolapse uh, and uh, um, how to go forward. And I will now stop and Jan can start taking the questions. Um, lovely. Thank you, Mr. Gupta, for that very interesting uh, presentation. We've got several questions. Um, let's start from the top. So I can probably answer the first one, which is, can you do any damage doing your pelvic floor exercises? Um, and I think the answer to that is possibly if you're not doing them correctly. Um, some patients, when they think they're contracting a pelvic floor, particularly if they're using some of the accessory muscles, um, you can almost be bearing down doing what's called a Valsalva maneuver and not um, actually contracting. In that case, that would make your prolapse worse. Um, and I think that's an advantage of having a good continence or a good specialist nurse assessment or, or women's health physiotherapist to ensure that you are doing those properly. And Jan, if, my, uh, if I may add with, on this point, um, some patients do ask this question, if they have a prolapse, they feel that uh, if they are continuing to sexually active, they may harm themselves. Uh, sexual activity in presence of prolapse should be absolutely fine. There shouldn't be a problem doing it and you won't harm yourself or your partner. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Um, and also slightly on the same line, would you recommend the use of a TENS device um, to aid with pelvic floor exercises. Um, so you can buy a lot of gadgets now that you put into the vagina that will give basically a little bit of electrical stimulation to your muscles. Um, they can be an advantage if you're having difficulty isolating your muscle and it's difficult to do a, a good effective uh, contraction. For me, if you've got significant prolapse, I probably wouldn't advise them, uh, particularly if the vaginal tissues are a little bit dry and thin, uh, because putting sort of a device in and out of the vagina can cause irritation um, and can cause more discomfort. Um, so it's just, yes, they may help, but I'd use them with, with caution. Uh, Mr. Gupta, is there anything I can do to prevent a prolapse before any signs or symptoms? Yeah, I think um, the the script which I said about uh, prevention of reoccurrence of prolapse after the surgery, the same script causes with uh, not having a prolapse in the first place. So if you can start your pelvic floor exercises sooner than later, then if you can, if if you are overweight, optimize your weight avoid lifting heavy weight, avoid constipation. And if you're a smoker, please, please try to stop preferably because these are the small things, but goes in a weak way to prevent your risk of having a prolapse in future. Thank you. Um, I have a rectocele and I'm awaiting surgery. I'm on HRT and have gone through the menopause. Would hormone estrogen via the vagina in addition be beneficial for me before the surgery to help healing? Um, it only depends on during examination whether you still have residual lack of hormones in the vagina. So if uh, sometimes even if you're on an HRT, but if you still have lack of estrogen and you have what is called vulvar vaginal atrophy, then we supplement with local estrogen, but not in every case. So it really depends on the examination finding of, the, of your surgeon. If your surgeon finds there's no vulvar vaginal atrophy and your hormone HRT, which you are on, is more than enough, then you don't necessarily need more estrogen through vagina. But if, it's, uh, if the atrophy is still present, 
then you may benefit from having it. So it really depends on the examination finding at the time, uh, uh, examination finding from your surgeon. Thank you. Um, do the risks of the treatment increase if you have adhesions from multiple previous surgeries? It depends on uh, which surgeries we're talking about. If, if you have vaginal surgeries in past, then the risk does increase and the success does reduce. So if you had a prolapse surgery already in the past and you have a repeat surgery, especially on the same site, if you have bladder surgery and you have a repeat bladder surgery, if you have bowel prolapse and you have a repeat bowel prolapse surgery, then obviously the scarring makes um, slightly more tricky, slightly more difficult, increases your complication rate and reduces your success rate. So therefore, um, we tend to avoid operating on a smaller prolapses because success rates are not that good because you can't make things flatter. But if uh, if you have to operate ever in future, then the, the success rates are not great. So first operation is always the best operation. However, if you had surgery somewhere else in the tummy or somewhere else, and we're not uh, doing any, um, and we're doing only pelvic floor operation, then that shouldn't uh, change any success chances of success or cause any problem for us if you're having a hysterectomy but you have a cesarean section or some people had an operation to remove the fibroid then it can be a bit tricky to do the operation but uh, otherwise um, it shouldn't have any impact if you have any surgery anywhere else um, apart from the vagina um, thank you i've got a couple of questions now relating to pessaries um, my nurse went straight to inviting me to have a pessary. She didn't really talk about pelvic floor exercises, but she didn't explain how the pessary works or how it stays in. Um, uh, that's um, quite individualized uh, kind of, uh, it's different to give an opinion on uh, somebody else's treatment, but the pessary is basically um, goes in the vagina and behind your pubic bone, which is a bone, and on the on the back of the vagina, which is called sacrum, which is a bone, which curves. So the pessary sits up there and it's not stitched anywhere and your muscles have to store, hold it in place so that it doesn't keep coming down. That's how it works. So the right side pessary just expands there and sits across there. So we press the pessary, compress it, put it back, open it so it sits in that little curvature of your pelvis and the bone in front to hold things in place. Um, that's how it works. Uh, but I think um, pelvic floor exercises should be done in parallel with the pessary, not just uh, in place of per, uh, pessary or if pessary is done, then there's no role of pelvic floor exercises. You have to constantly make sure the muscles are strong enough. So even if you have pessary, you should continue with pelvic floor. Um, thank you, Mr. Gupta. Um, do bioidentical hormone replacement creams work instead of the HRT creams that you're talking about? Um, I do not have much. Um, I do not have much experience with alternatives to uh, the hormones, estrogen. So, bioidentical estrogens, I don't have much uh, experience with. Uh, I only have experience with vaginal moisturizers, which are used in patients who have, for example, breast cancer or get side effects or have allergic reactions to hormones. They work by making um, your symptoms a bit better and you're dragging and pain a bit better, but they usually don't build up the tissues very well. Um, thank you. Um, I can feel a lump coming out of my vagina and it feels like something is coming out when I sit down. Could this be a womb prolapse? It happened since I started coughing a lot due to COVID. Um, it really uh, depends on um, your age and what's happening. Um, it can be your womb prolapse. But as I said, in the front where the bladder is coming down, it can be a bladder prolapse as well, which is which does feel like a bulge, ball, or some people um, describe in a various ways. Um, it can be the back of the vagina coming into, which is a bowel prolapse. It can be either of the womb or, or neck of the womb or bladder or the back of the vagina. However, as I said, it depends on different ages as well. We have seen 
fibroids coming down like this, presenting like a, um, a bulge in the vagina. We have also seen vaginal cyst, which looks like this uh, uh, bulge, which is coming down. So it's worth getting it checked, but it can be either way. More commonly a prolapse, but it can be other things as well. So it's worth getting checked. Thank you. Um, why would be, why might it be difficult to have prolapse operation if I've had a hysterectomy due to fibroids, or would it be difficult? Um, if uh, you had a hysterectomy because of fibroid, doing a prolapse operation from the vagina should not be difficult um, or anything um, out of ordinary. This is quite a quite a routine. Uh, operation we do um, for a prolapse if you had a previous uh, hysterectomy through the tummy by the keyhole or open. So it shouldn't be more difficult than any normal um, operation for a prolapse. Thank you. Um, I can probably answer this question. Um, is there benefit in starting pelvic floor exercises if I already have a rectus seal? Um, and the answer is absolutely. Um, as I said earlier, first line treatment should always be good structured pelvic floor exercises. Um, and I think as Mr. Gupta said, just because you have a prolapse doesn't mean that you need to have surgery. Um, it's working through the treatment options. Um, you know, just because we think your prolapse is small or moderate, you may feel that, you know, your symptoms, it's more bothersome than that. Um, it's very difficult to get a successful operation on something that's generally relatively small because um, it, it's, it's harder to do the surgery. So pelvic floor would absolutely be your, your first line treatment. Um, so yeah, definitely pelvic floor is your first line. Um, and if you think you're struggling with them, um, then look at um, coming to Benedin and we'll help you out with those. The pelvic floor will never go wrong, whether it will help or not. It's it's a, it's different question, but pelvic floor you will never pelvic floor exercises you will, can't go wrong. Even if you had a surgery in future, then to reduce your chance of coming back, you will need pelvic floor <laughs> stronger. So you will never go wrong with pelvic floor exercises. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I've had a suspension operation before, can I have another? Um, suspension of your uterus uh, is that because. Yeah, it just says suspension operation, so I'm not sure. Um, now, is that because of the with the mesh? Because suspension operation we don't do anymore for the, the prolapse, apart from a very selected mesh operation we do. We don't do suspension operation. If you're talking about sacrospinous fixation, which is a stitch to uh, reattach the neck of the womb um, to a strong ligament called sacrospinous ligament, if you had already had it once, I wouldn't repeat it again, because if it's not formed scarring once properly, uh, it's a bit difficult to do on the same site, and it doesn't give a good good effect. And other suspension operation, we usually don't off, uh, do this nowadays. I know it's in many years ago that people used to do suspensions, but they've long been um, not very commonly done nowadays. Uh, thank you. And how successful is the closing of the vagina? Uh, it's a, it is fairly a, a successful operation. Closing closing of the vagina is fairly a successful operation. Uh, if if in the first six to eight weeks, while the healing is taking place, if you don't have uh, blood clot in the vagina or you don't have infection, i.e. the stitches get time to heal up properly, then it becomes a really successful procedure. Uh, thank you. Um, and how long should you use the hormone treatments for? Uh, if uh, it's helping you out, um, then, and there's no side effect or contraindication, I tend to, uh, once we've done the treatment of uh, atrophy or uh, vulvovaginal atrophy, I tend to recommend patients should uh, carry on with twice weekly little um, pessaries, which is uh, Vagifem pessaries. Uh, because once you stop, you go back to where you started from. So if you keep maintaining those of twice a week, uh, which is again even smaller dose, then it does have a good um, um, good effect. But if you really don't want to take hormones, if you want to stop, then you can give it three to four months, then stop, and then restart when you get the symptoms back up. Uh, thank you. Um, and is is the surgery safe? And is it all right to go up and down the stairs straight afterwards? Um, 
I would like to think surgery is safe there. Otherwise, <laughs> I wouldn't be in the job. <laughs> so I'm sure surgeries are safe. It comes with this complication. Doesn't ho- happen too often, and 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 the re- well, and the results are quite rewarding. So when as a surgeon, when you see patients' quality of life getting better, you feel very rewarded. Uh, if you go home after surgery and you have to have a flight of stairs because your bedroom is upstairs or a toilet upstairs, then going one or two flight of stairs is not a problem. Keep going up and down. It's more of a listening to your body. So if you feel that you are you are able to uh, to go up and down the stairs um, more frequently, then you, yeah, build it up. Obviously, you're not going to run up and down, but you're going to be gentle to yourself. But going up and down is not a problem. Uh, thank you very much. Um, does joint hypermobility syndrome make prolapse more likely or worse? It it does make prolapse more likely, and it does increase your chance of uh, of prolapse getting worse. So hypermobility it more more than likely is because of uh, what is called collagen problem, which is a connective tissue problem for your body, and that does increases your chance of weakness of the collagen tissue, which basically holds holds the organ in place. And when it does uh, get weaker, it tends to drop. Thank you. Um, is it possible to get discomfort on one side of the pelvis if you have prolapse? Um, it can happen, but uh, it can happen. But uh, usually it's uh, more bilateral or both sides. Um, it can happen that it's more pronounced on one side than other uh, and uh, it's not um, it's not common but it's uh, it can happen but usually it's a dragging sensation in both the side and the center uh, can you use a pessary lifelong or do you end up having to have surgery because the prolapse worsens no if it it works well for you you can use the pessary as long as you want and sometimes uh, I've seen if it's a moderate prolapse and you have used pessary for five, six years, sometimes you um, vaginal shape changes and that's why you have to keep change, getting it checked every six months. That is the right size for you. I've seen that we have to change the size of the pessary and occasionally after a few years of use, some patients then stop using it because of uh, uh, various uh, changes in their skin and the size of the pessary as well. So some people may need it forever. Some people may go for surgery, but in, in, in long and short, you can carry on pessary as long as you want. Uh, thank you. Um, somebody here said, is it okay to leave a prolapse unattended if it's not giving any discomfort? I'd like to try the pelvic floor exercises before seeing my GP. Um, and I'm 63 years old and I would definitely say yes. Um, if it's not overly bothersome and it's maybe just been picked up on a smear test or on another examination, um, absolutely do your pelvic floor exercises, you know, for up to six months. Also make sure you're not constipated, keep your weight in check um, and all of the other things that Mr. Gupta um, has talked about as so, well. So Jan, if I may add at this point, um, I purposely didn't mention in my um, this lecture, uh, this webinar, but maybe for next one, I'll be more prescriptive for the patients as, as well. There are four stages of prolapse. Stage one is starting of prolapse. Stage two, when it's coming into the 50% of, into the vagina, but just not starting to come out of your body. Grade three is when it started to come out of your body. And grade four is everything hanging out. So if you've got grade two prolapse or bordering to grade three, and it's not symptomatic, you can leave and try pelvic floor exercises. But if it's grade three, and then if it's going through grade four, and you'll be surprised how many patients don't attend when it's even grade four, uh, because it's not bothering them that too much, I think you should at least see a healthcare professional, because if it's exposed to air for a long time, and it's, and it's come out of your body, then it can cause ulcers. And because the blood supply also reduces, the return of the blood supply reduces when it's down so much. And also it can develop ulcers. Then the healing and everything becomes so difficult. So even if you don't want anything and if it's exposed out, see a healthcare professional, you may be able to manage with a bit of a hormone cream or something rather than going through any procedure. But yeah, rather if it's not coming out of your body and it's not exposed, then as Jan said, you don't need to see us or anyone else, just do pelvic floor exercises. Lovely. And if you do the pelvic floor exercises, will the cervix go back up? Um, I wouldn't say that its cervix will 
I mean, it marginally may go up. Obviously, the, the tissues will get strengthened and that will pull things up. It won't go back to where it was. Um, and depending, again, on where your cervix was, if it is stage two prolapse, which is like you're still inside your body, then if you do the pelvic floor exercises, it will make things stronger. It may move up a bit. And more importantly, your symptoms might get better by just tiny movement of the cervix up when the muscles are more stronger. But once it starts to come out of your body, it doesn't significantly go up. Uh, thank you. Um, and interestingly, there's two questions from different people just asking about caruncles yeah. um, and using hormones for that. Is that sort of relating to prolapse at all? So caruncle has got nothing to do with prolapse. Caruncle is from your urethra, which is a tube which drains water out. Caruncle doesn't need treatment. Uh, caruncle, if it causes you bleeding or something and which is uh, bothering you up, then you can have estrogen, which also helps with caruncle. However, if it's causing you constant bleeding all the time, then we can take the caruncle out, but it's not caused because of prolapse. Thank you. Um, and what is the recovery period if you have the closing of the vagina? Is it the uh, same, same as others? Yeah. Same. Thank you, you need the stitches to heal up. Lovely. Um, lovely. Thank you very much, Mr. Gupta. Um, I'm very sorry if we didn't answer all of your questions. And if you provided your name, we will do so via email. If you would like to discuss or book your consultation, please use the contact details on your screen and call between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. And we are offering a discount for joining this session with the terms, as you can see on the screen. You will receive a short survey and I'd be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback. And I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. The next webinar is on Thursday, the 9th of February at half past six, and that is on hernia treatments. And please visit the website if you wish to sign up. So on behalf of myself, Mr. Gupta and the team at Benedon Hospital, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today. And we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.